purpose. I just had to make up my mind a long time ago that I'm going to do this come hell or high water. Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. If you want to open your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I want you to know that as you are building foundations in your life and the lives of your children as you build for other generations as you work feverishly to establish things to get on solid ground there are certain things that you can't do until you get stable you have to get first things first and sometimes before I can even build it's like I've got to get a solid foundation up under me because I'm fighting other stuff as I'm trying to get this built in my life. And so I want to deal with, with some of that as we are growing in the things of God and becoming established and dealing with the opposition that comes to try to fight the plan of God as God intends it for your life. Sometimes it is not until you get a prophetic word from God of what God's going to do in your life that all hell breaks loose. Sometimes it's not until you get the, 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 the appearance of what looks like a great blessing from God that you begin to become really challenged in your life because every word that God gives you will be tried. Every prophetic promise any time that God gives a prophetic promise, there's always a problem in front of the promise. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when you got the, the prophecy that God was going to do great things in your life, if there were no problems, no complications, no threats to it? But the reality is that there are threats to everything that you will deal with and everything that we face in our lives. There are threats to try to stop God's plan from coming into manifestation. In Galatians, did I say Ephesians or Galatians? I meant Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Since Galatians is the last chapter of the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter is the last chapter of Galatians. And see, my one part of my page says Ephesians, and the other part says Galatians. And I'm looking on the Ephesian side. I'm getting ahead of myself. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 4. I want you to take this as a present word of God for you. But let every, each one examine his own work. Whose work? His own work. Let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Now let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Notice verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You'll reap if you don't faint. Now, realize that he never would have even had to tell us that unless there was going to be a delay between the time of sowing and the time of reaping. It is during that waiting time that we become tempted to faint, to lose heart, to give up, to become frustrated, to become discouraged that it will never happen. He already knew how we would respond. This is why you don't realize what a miracle it was of God when he told the children of Israel to walk around the walls of Jericho seven times on that seventh day, they had already walked around one time for six days, and so now on the seventh day, they are told to walk seven times. They've already been around 
one time each day for six days, and now on the seventh day, they're told to go around the thing for seven times. Now, anytime you've been around something six days and nothing happened, and then you go around on the seventh time, on the seventh day, the first time that you go, that's the seventh journey around and nothing happens, you start getting discouraged. Now, imagine this challenge that God says, I want you to just walk around this wall. I want you to just walk around it. One time each day for six days, and on the seventh day, you walk around seven times. Now imagine walking around on that first day. All of these folks, warriors, walking around, and the great challenge, they couldn't open their mouth. They couldn't open their mouth. Now that was a fight in and of itself. They couldn't open their mouth. You all know how certain people are. You know how it is if you take your children on a trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are, are we there yet? To walk around for six days and you can't even open your mouth. Now you know they got hot and you know that their feet started hurting and they couldn't complain about the condition. God says, don't open your mouth. Don't you open your mouth. That was the real battle, was to endure situations and they couldn't open their mouth about it. You're talking about discipline and self-control? No wonder when they shouted. <laughs> Can you imagine being pinned up for seven days, a solid week. I asked us one time to go a week without complaining. Now, now most, most folks couldn't even make it the first day because somebody had to remind them, you know what, you're not we're supposed to complain. You're not supposed to complain. And we, I mean, before we could get out and get to a restaurant, before we could get out of the parking lot, the, the, the temptation to complain now for seven days, a solid week, he says, don't open your mouth. Can you imagine why he now has to tell us, listen, be not deceived. God is not marked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And if you sow to the flesh corruption, you'll of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap positive life, peace joy. You're going to reap so many wonderful things. But here is the great temptation is that when you sow good works, helping other people, sharing with other people, giving to other people, and then you get in a bind yourself and your circumstances appear to make the word of God seem as though it's not true. Because you gave your last dime, sowing it into somebody else's life, and now you're without Anybody ever been there? And you had to wait and believe for God to bring deliverance in your life? Now listen, he's telling us right at that point in your life, when you help somebody else to fight, you introduce somebody else to a person and then they got married and then you still don't have anybody. <laughs> listen, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that shall he also reap. That shall he also reap. Listen, he says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't grow weary in well-doing. But I want you to back up here to verse 4 again. But let each one examine his own work. Let each one examine his own work. Let's see what you've been sowing. He says, take a closer examination as to what you've been sowing, and then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now, you see, you change yourself, and then your world changes. When you change you, your circumstances change. I tell you that if you would kick the person who's responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't be able to sit down for weeks. Now notice what he says, let each one examine his own work. His own work. Now we are experts at examining other people's work. And see, here's the deal. We judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. It's like, I, I didn't mean to hurt you, but, but you did. But I didn't mean to do it. You, you, you see, it's all right because I didn't mean to do it. 
See, we judge other people by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. Now notice, let each one examine his own work. Isn't it interesting that the Spirit of God, speaking through the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia, would tell them to let every man, every person examine their own work. Now, I, I, I want you to make a note of this. Number one, to see yourself clearly. See yourself clearly. See yourself clearly. Now, in order to see yourself clearly, you have to use mirrors. Now, mirrors for us are actually people who are close enough to see our flaws that we can't see. Are you listening? You can't see what your back looks like. You have to depend on other relationships around you. You can't even see. You don't even know how you come off to other people. Use your, your mirrors. Let a man examine himself. You have to see yourself clearly. That's number one. Number two, admit your flaws honestly. Admit your flaws honestly. Just, just be honest with yourself. This is not broadcasting your flaws to the world. This, this is just about being honest with yourself. Honest with yourself. If you don't be honest with yourself, you can't help yourself. I mean, you know how we try to get in shape before we go to the doctor? We try to get our own blood pressure down, try to get our weight down and everything. Before we go, we try to get in shape so they don't find anything. So that, you know, that everything is okay when, when we are examined. That when we are examined, we will found, be found to be approved. So notice, exam see yourself clearly, admit your flaws honestly. Number three, discover your strengths joyfully. Discover your strengths joyfully. Because when you examine yourself, you're going to find some positive things about yourself. So discover your, your strengths joyfully. And then number four, build on those strengths passionately. You examine yourself. You know, see yourself clearly. Admit your flaws honestly. Discover your strengths joyfully. But then build on those strengths passionately because you have strengths in your life. You have strengths in your life. Now, make a note of this. Not realizing what you want is a problem of knowledge. Not realizing what you want is a problem of knowledge. Not realizing what you want. That's a problem of knowledge. I don't know what I want. But Jesus said, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and then you shall have them. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Now, not realizing what you want is a problem of knowledge. But not pursuing what you want is a problem of motivation. Not pursuing what you want is a problem of motivation. And then thirdly, not achieving what you want is a problem of persistence. Not achieving what you want is a problem of persistence. You see, winners never quit, and quitters never win. The problem is, it's not that we fail, it's that we give up too soon. We give up too soon. And here, the scriptures is reminding us to say, let everyone examine his own work. Let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. But notice in verse 7, be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. And then couple that with verse 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good. Let us not grow weary. The natural tendency, while you are doing good and you are not reaping the harvest, is to grow weary. It's okay to admit that you've been there. When you're working and working and it looks like nobody is appreciating what you've done. And sometimes, you know, you give people things to try to help them and then they squander it. They mess over it. Have you ever helped anybody and then they just, they just took the blessing that you worked hard for and, and sold into their life and then they just messed it up? And then come back and have the nerve to ask you for more? You don't know anybody like that, do you? Look straight ahead because I know some of them are in your family. 
But he says, let us not grow weary in, while doing good and well-doing, for we shall reap in due season under what conditions? If you faint not, if you don't give up, if you don't give up, you're going to reap it if you don't give up. If you don't give up, you are going to reap it. So the key to reaping the blessing is actually being diligent. It's actually being diligent. It's just being diligent. You ever notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13? But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. If you don't endure to the end, if you give up too quickly, you see, even salvation is a reward of diligently enduring, enduring, diligently enduring. And that's what we're called to do, to diligently endure. Now, I want to give you just some simple, simple keys to help us to endure when you're in between that season of where you've already sown. You've already sown and you're wait, waiting on the reaping. You're, you're waiting on the harvest. Because you see, many of us right now, we need a harvest right now of things that have been sown in our past. We need the harvest right now. But now he's telling us, listen, don't stop doing good just because that harvest has not manifested yet. He says, don't get it twisted. He says, be not deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Whatever a person sows is what that person is going to reap under the condition that they do not quit or lose heart or fail to be persistent. I mean, do you know how often I find that people pray about things and prayer is a form of sowing? It is a form of sowing. People will, you, you, you sow in tears and you reap in joy. And there are people that will cry while they're praying and then they will reap a harvest because they, they were praying, they were praying, they were praying. Prayer, prayer changes things. But what happens when you pray and things are not changing? You see, the great temptation is for the devil to sit on your ear and whisper in your ear, you know what, you've been praying and if that prayer was doing any good, you know, you would have had some, some, some change by now. So why don't you quit praying? See, the, tr the, the strategy of the devil is to try to make you believe. See, be not deceived. Be not deceived. The deception comes when you've been praying and nothing has happened yet. It's to think that because it hasn't happened yet that it won't happen to make you now weary in well-doing. Prayer is well-doing. And if you become weary in well-doing, you'll stop doing it. You'll stop doing it. And the whole plan of the devil is to get you so frustrated by the delay of the harvest that you will become weary in well-doing and go out and do what the rest of the world is doing. And I've seen people backslide and wind up doing the same thing that the people in the world because they got frustrated through their impatience. So I want to give you just a, a few little keys here that I believe that can be helpful to your life. Number one is to start with a tiny bit first and then build your way up. Start with a tiny bit and then build your way up. Start with a tiny bit and then build your way up. Because what happens if you bite off too much too soon and you try to pray a whole long period of time, then the next day your mind is going to dread even doing it because it's like, oh God, here's another day. And you can't even do it because it seems like it's so much. There's some people that make the mistake of when they try to do family devotions, they start the kids off with too much. Give them a little bit just to get the habit in their life, just a little bit. And, and then, then go ahead and, and build up. Here's the second key. Establish a time. Establish a time to be diligent in whatever it is that you're doing. Establish a particular time to do it. As I said, there's a lot, there are a lot of things that will never happen in your life until you schedule it. There's the power of scheduling it. Anytime that you want something to happen, you must schedule it. You can't just say, well, if we find the time. No, you're not going to ever find the time. You have to schedule the time. You make the time. Psalm 55, 17, he says, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud. 
gave specific times, evening, morning, and noon. I'm going to pray and cry aloud. That, that was David. He was establishing a definite time of his prayer, a definite time of prayer. And so if you want to be a, a, a successful and diligent prayer warrior, set a specific uninterruptible time to pray. Don't do it at a time when you know that your children are going to be knocking on your door and calling your name and the telephone is ringing off the hook. Set a time for it to happen. And then here's another key that keeps you from becoming weary in well-doing is to keep the reward in your view. Keep the reward in your view. Keep it in your view. The reward of your race is what motivates you to train so hard and run so fast. Remember Hebrews 11:6. but without faith is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a what? A rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek him. Diligently. And if they're diligent with it, it means that they don't stop and start. It means that they are diligent. They are diligently seeking God. So when he says, be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. For you're going to reap in due season, if you faint not, don't get weary in well-doing. And if you really want to keep your discipline to not give up, I would tell you this fourth thing to do, which is to fast in order to discipline your appetites. Fast in order to discipline your appetite. Fasting changes you, not God. Fasting changes you, not God. Now, if there's anything that you are struggling with in your life, you fast from it. Fast from it. Whatever it is, if you get too much television, fast from it. If you're, if you're talking on your cell phone and texting too much and, and, and spending too much time on the computer, fast from it. It'll help you to get it back under control. If certain uh, sweets have dominated and controlled your life, fast from it. You know what fasting does? Fasting will starve that thing from the roots. It'll starve it from the roots. Whatever it, that has been plaguing your life, it will starve it from the roots. If there's an ungodly relationship that is not healthy from you, fast from it. So that you starve it from the roots. You want it to dry up from the roots. It's got its roots in you and its tentacles in you and you can't live without it. Fast from it. Don't talk to them. Fast from it. You'll begin to cause it to die from the roots. There's certain things that you can never get out of your life until you fast from it. And when you fast from it, with the help of God, you're seeing you can live without it. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, fast from it and you'll begin to kill it from the roots. You'll have withdrawal symptoms. It will be hard. But when you sow to your flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But when you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life and peace, life and peace, life and peace, life and peace. I just wanted to remind you and encourage you, be not weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season if you faint not. There is the great temptation every time that you've sown and you're waiting on the harvest to come in in your life. The tendency is that in the midst of your doing well, is to compromise your walk with God. Compromise your faithfulness. Compromise your commitment. Compromise your devotion. It is to compromise. It is to compromise your prayer because the devil will have whispered to you your prayers are not making any difference. And the devil is a liar. Be not weary in well-doing. Let me just tell you, don't disqualify yourself because you get impatient. Be not weary. The temptation is to be weary, to get tired and to faint in the way and to say, I'm giving up on this. Be not weary in well-doing. You're going to reap in due season if you faint not. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.